What I want to talk about is the inclusive design of um, open education resources and the inclusive design of the many environments, tools and, and offerings that you have here or that have been represented here and um, that you're working on with your colleagues. Um, w one of the things that people might have noticed uh, earlier in uh, or closer to Wednesday was that there was a, a fairly sizable group of individuals who were specifically interested in the accessibility of open source and so we ha had a just prior to this conference a UNESCO forum that um, gathered together accessibility e experts and community leaders in open source to discuss just this issue and so some of what I'm going to present are uh, the outcomes of that but before I get into that, I want to address the issue of um, the accessibility, the inclusive design of OER. And one of the things that I've, I've noticed in this particular community, and, and often when I go to open ed um, uh, sessions, is that it seems to be somewhat of a scary topic. Um, and the minute I bring it up, um, I, I sometimes feel a little bit like the accessibility pariah. And so the first thing I want to do, what's that? <laughs> no, I, <laughs> the first thing I want to do is to dispel that fear or that anxiety people have about this topic and hopefully uh, make it such that I'm not uh, the accessibility pariah at the next meeting that we, we come to. So um, the topic of my talk is one size does not fit all. And the, the first message I want to give is that accessibility is relative. When people talk about accessibility here, frequently they talk about like a, a certification, a, a roadblock you have to uh, come over, uh, some sort of test you have to pass and then you, you get this stamp on your OER or on your tool or on your environment or your, on your initiative that says, I am accessible. Um, but uh, the thing I want to say is there is no such thing as a fully accessible open education resource or open education environment op or open education system. And you do not need to, you probably cannot, and you should not um, make every OER accessible. And I think that's one of the scary things. People think, oh my gosh, I have these 2,000 resources and how am I going to make modifications or shift everything that I have in my repository up on my website that I'm distributing to these men number of classes already. It isn't the case that you're going to have to um, recreate, retool, um, change everything that you've already done. Um, one of a different way to look at disability and accessibility is that um, accessibility or a disability is experienced when there's a mismatch and in the learning environment or in the open education um, resource environment the mismatch is between what the learner needs and what education is offered and therefore it's not a personal trait of the learner but an artifact of the relationship between the learner and the learning environment or education delivery and so um, another way of viewing this is that in different instances we all face a disability in learning maybe it's because we didn't do our homework and we didn't get the background knowledge or um, we are um, we didn't get enough sleep or um, and if you're sitting in a class where, say, it's an audio lecture and you have a classic disability such as blindness, then you, in fact, might be the least disabled in that room. And the other individuals who have encountered other mismatches are, in fact, more disabled. So, by the same token, accessibility is the ability of the learning environment to adjust to the needs of learners. The flexibility of edu the education environment, the delivery system, and the content. And um, it's helped by the availability of adequate alternative content and activities that meet the, the learning needs. Um, so w one of the other messages I want to give is that you should adopt inclusive design for selfish reasons. Uh, this is not something about charity, it's not something about accommodating a group that's out there that wants to get in. Um, it's, and especially if you have no time, 
and you're crunched for time in terms of creating resources because in fact inclusive design has been shown quite empirically to save you a lot of time in a lot of your efforts, especially if you have no money. Um, and that's one of the other reasons that many people give. Well, I, I, have, I don't even have enough funding to do what I need to do. How can I take this on? Well, it's been shown that if you design your resources inclusively, if you, if you design your delivery system inclusively, then you're going to save money. And if, even if you feel you have no students with disabilities, and even if you believe you will never have any students with disabilities, there's reasons to um, practice inclusive design. Um, the other message I want to give is that the inclusive design or accessible design or um, the scary topic is in fact very, very much aligned with everything that we have in the conference. And so this is just the slogan from your t-shirt, and I was going to wear mine but I didn't. Um, reuse, revise, remix, redistribute is what we're saying uh, we want to achieve here. And in fact, if we design things inclusively, if we use inclusive design principles, um, this is exactly what uh, we will be able to use, the, things become more reusable. It's easier to remix, to create mashups, to um, revise things, to update them. It's easier to redistribute things as well. Um, inclusive design supports portability. Uh, we, we've talked a lot about the portability of our OERs and uh, if you design them in, in Inclusively, what happens is they become device dependent, independent. So they they can move from a uh, mobile system to an, a desktop system to a web application. They can move across web applications. They can also change contexts much more easily because um, inclusively designed systems are more flexible. And in terms of other forms of flexibility, um, they can. Uh, cross disciplines more easily, they can cross all of the different boundaries that you may wish your re learning resources to cross. And in terms of flexibility, they, they are flexible in that they adapt to the needs of the learner. You can update them much more easily because they're structured, you can navigate through them, you can find the pieces that need to be updated. And as a result of all of that, they have much greater longevity and they become um, more usable. Um, this is, how many of you have heard of the, a thing called the curb cut phenomenon or the curb cut effect? Yes, Steve has, and Ira has, of course. <laughs> um, basically what this refers to is, um, if you look at the sidewalks, there's a curb cut. Those curb cuts were made for someone with uh, a wheelchair, but of course the majority of people that use uh, the curb cuts are uh, skateboard users, people with baby carriages, etc. So if we've designed something for someone with a disability, it, it usually follows that every, it becomes much more useful for, for everyone. An example of a digital curb cut is the captioning. Um, the, those text transcript of what is happening, what is being spoken on television, um, those were initially created for people who are deaf and hard of hearing, but um, the majority of people, in recent studies done by WGBH, it was shown that uh, only 2% of, of uh, or people who are hard of hearing or deaf, only represent 2% of the users of those captions now. Um, can people guess what might be the other uses of the captions? Yes, exactly. Yeah. 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 What was the sorry? Right, right. Watching TV on fast forward. Yeah. Any other? <laughs> Fitness centers. What's that? Yeah. Second language learners. Um, and spouses who want to, one, where one wants to go to sleep and the other wants to continue watching the favorite um, program. So, and those actually make up the 98% of the use. So something that was initially created for someone with a disability becomes much more usable for everyone. So that usability usually translates to reaching a far greater audience. And um, it represents good pedagogy. Um, when you create your OERs or when you create your learning content, your curriculum, your learning tools, whether it's constructivist learning approaches or, or other forms of pedagogy, um, by trying to address the needs of diverse learners, you um, get at what in fact are we trying to teach? What is the essence of what we're trying to, to um, uh, 
achieve and you focus far less on things like presentation and, and other things which seem to sometimes distract from uh, good pedagogy. And of course it uh, implies good design. Um, things that are designed accessibly, whether it's the door handles on the doors or the um, uh, the buildings that are more accessible, they tend to have a much more robust design that survives all sorts of contexts and all sorts of, of individuals who need to use it. So, um, if I haven't persuaded you yet, or if I have persuaded you, to, you yet, um, how do we do it? What? How do we go about implementing um, inclusive design in an OER environment? So there, there's a lot of help. There are, there's actually an international standard that's been created simply for the inclusive design of learning resources and specifically um, created such that it works best with an open education resource. There um, are international open source communities to support inclusive design. And there are toolkits, handbooks, libraries, APIs, SDKs, use cases, scenarios, business cases, examples, models, components, all available. Um, so this is not an, a new thing that we need to start from scratch. There is a, a great deal of help um, out there to, ha to assist in making open education resources accessible. Uh, the, the international standard that I was talking about is called Access for All. It's also referred to as ISO 24751, parts 1 through 5, and um, it's also referred to as the IMS Access for All standard, and actually, just as we speak, Jack <laughs> walks in from IMS. Um, and this is um, basically a standard that's all about matching and supporting um, what I said earlier in terms of inclusive design. It consists of um, a series of, of two parts, two matching parts. Uh, one is a common language for learners to express their personal needs and preferences in a portable private personal preference profile. Um, and if uh, I won't do any more alliterations like that, but uh, it's basically it's a way to functionally express how do you want things displayed, how do you want to control things, um, what are the types of scaffolds that you as a learner want, and it's not intended only for learners with disabilities and it's intended for all learners or not for learners who've been classically defined as having a disability. Um, there is also, it, it respects privacy in that that no one needs to declare that they have a particular disability. They simply, they, they don't need to specify whether they need um, an audio interface because they're learning in the car or that because they're using a screen reader. It, you simply declare that you do need an audio interface in this context at this time. Um, the, the other half of the standard is a common language for labeling tools and learning resources so they can be matched to those learner needs. And the, that part of it is very, very lightweight and it can be done cumulatively. So the original author of the learning resource or the tool doesn't need to do all the work. Um, other individuals can add additional labels to something to say, oh, and by the way, this is also, also useful for someone who say has dyslexia or um, for whom um, English is a second language. Um, so given these two uh, s sets of standards, one to mark up the resources and one for a learner to declare what they need and want, um, you don't need to create an OER that fits all. Uh, in order to use this type of a system or an access for all compliant system, the OER should be have sh flexible presentation, but it, there's lots of reasons for good flexible presentation, um, other reasons for good flexible uh, um, presentation, meaning using the sorts of tools that you have in HTML or in JavaScript which allow, or in styling system or skinning systems, which allow you to do things like change the contrast, increase the size of, of letters, um, re redo the layout. That helps you to uh, move from one computer to the next, from a mobile platform to a desktop platform, different screen sizes and different modes of, of delivery. Um, there need to be available alternatives or variations, um, but those, so the original resource doesn't need to meet everybody's needs. Um, 
but there should be pointers to and uh, somewhere additional resources that address the same learning goal but address it for different individuals. And so um, you can address therefore the problem incrementally. The original creator of the open education resource will create the that resource label what who it is intended for who is the learner that it's intended for and then someone can come along and say if there's a video in there create the caption and add that and label it well this is this is the same um, or this has the same uh, learning intent but here it is uh, for individuals that require captioning. Someone, the next person can come along and create a French translation and link it to it, or a um, description of all the visual images, or an alternative to the um, highly uh, to the simulation that is there, such that someone who can't use a, uh, a mouse can uh, control it with a keyboard, etc. And so the system supports crowdsourcing and peer support uh, and the, the onus of making sure that the learning resources meet everybody's needs does not have to sit on the original author. It also allows a lot of creativity in uh, doing things. One of the things that seems to get scary about accessibility or inclusive design is that people think, oh, then I can't be technically creative because I might it might then become inaccessible um, or I won't meet accessibility legislation. But what this allows is it allows you to create, be as creative as possible and uh, someone else can then or, or you can also create alternatives that address the particular needs that, that might not be met by that technically innovative um, thing. Oops. So, what are some available tools that implement this? There's um, a set of web services, and these are open source web services that can be linked to um, any web application that you have or web delivery tool that you have. And one example of this is trans something called Transformable. And it consists of actually a series of web services. There's something called Preferable, which allows is, is a wizard that allows the learner to easily create that portable personal preference profile that's also private. Um, it, and the wizard uh, puts it into um, a very easy to understand language and allows you to uh, create this uh, a a small actually XML string that can be on a server, that can be on a USB stick, that can be on a smart card, that can be housed in various portable ways so that the learner can take it from one LMS to the other or from one public um, internet uh, uh, station to another or from home to another location. There's um, a web service called Stylable and this allows you to create um, restylable user interfaces or restylable um, uh, presentations of your ob of the learning objects or learning resources. Um, it uses CSS and um, XML styling conventions and it it uh, is cross cross platform. So what it does is it provides you or creates for you um, styles which will meet the preference needs that have been declared by the learner. And then there's a service called Sensible, and Sensible um, disaggregates and reaggregates the components so that uh, different um, presentations of the OER can be pr uh, provided or delivered to different learners. So if I'm a learner who requires captions to all video, then it will uh, extract the captions and deliver it to the learner. Um, if I'm a learner that requires a different language, uh, then it will retrieve the the uh, learning resource with the other language and, and uh, present it. And then there's a, a tool called Authorable, which um, helps you to author a OER that is uh, transformable, or that where the presentation can be transformed. And it allows you to point to, as an educator, other learning resources that might that meet the same needs or that uh, can be swapped in and out or act as alternatives to your resource. And of course, authorable allows not just the primary or the original uh, author of the learning resource to do that, other people can do that. So if I'm in a class um, and I'm going to use an original learning resource, then I can uh, um, 
but I have a different set of learner needs, then I can create pointers to a different set from that learning resource. Okay. Any questions about this? I had, I saw some. No. Okay. <laughs> Good. There are um, a few example implementations as well of um, transformable and access for all uh, types of um, services. Um, one of them. Whoops. Oh shoot. <laughs> <coughs> is the Inclusive Learning Exchange, and this is implemented in a, a number of places. Um, this is a um, learning object repository that is used um, in the literacy community in uh, Canada uh, quite extensively. And I'll, I'll leave you to explore that yourself. Um, whoops. That is not part of Tile. I'm not sure what I got. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Um, another implementation is in a learning management system called A Tutor, um, where uh, it's embedded in a learning content management system and the learning content management system can uh, retrieve and deliver uh, the appropriate resources. So, um, inclusive design is also, I mean, the, it, as is shown in each of these examples and, and as you'll learn as a principal, it's no sweat if and because you design it inclusively from the start. Um, many of these things support doing it under the covers so that it doesn't have to be an onerous thing that everybody has to think about all the time. It just comes naturally with the tools. It comes naturally with the authoring environment that you're using. Um, you don't have to train everybody in a, a set of guidelines or a set of, of design principles. It can be embedded in the OER creation system in your workflow and become part of a sort of habituated process. Um, it's best, uh, it works best if it's at the beginning of the food chain. Um, so if there are things that are going to be reused again and again, then if those are designed accessibly, um, then they will propagate throughout the food chain and, and um, I'll sh talk a little bit more about it, another project that pr uh, practices that. And um, we can distribute much of the heavy lifting of creating things inclusively. So um, moving on to another uh, project that helps is there is a community to help in all of this. And this is um, the Fluid Project, which, is, which was originally funded by Mellon and Ira here, is actually the uh, supporter of and one of the initiators of, of Fluid. And um, this is the Fluid site. And as you can see, it's um, a project, an international community that is looking at designing software that works for everyone. Um, and it's a growing uh, community and um, available, working in the same domain that many of the projects here are and at many of the universities that you work at or educational institutions that you work at. Um, the Fluid project was uh, created to address one particular dilemma, actually a number of dilemmas, but one of the main dilemmas it was uh, created to address is that we, we had a growing number of tools in the academic software domain and there were a growing number of developers. There was very little interoperability between all of the tools that were being created and there was very little attention paid to um, user experience. So the, there was no consistent user interface and no consistent user experience for the learner who had to move from one open um, source tool to the next or one community source tool, academic tool to the next. Um, but at the, on the other end, we had a huge and growing diversity of learners, uh, but also educators and developers and administrators. Um, the diversity spread across all sorts of domains, including diversity of disciplines, 
diversity of background, language, age, ability, culture. So there was no way to agree upon a common user interface or a consistent way of doing things because, of course, um, if you agreed upon one standard, then it would not, in fact, meet the, the diversity. So the question that we had within um, the um, open source or community source community was we have this growing diversity and a need for cons consistency. How can we meet both? Do we need to choose one or the other or can we have our cake and eat it too? And the Fluid Project was uh, the response to this, um, a way to both um, accommodate diversity but provide a, a good user experience, consistency of the user interface, consistency of the user interface behavior um, for each learner. So Fluid is a number of things. There's uh, the, the most useful thing is, or no, actually, I'm not going to say that. There are many things, many very useful things within Fluid. But one of the things that's quite relevant to this community is that there's a living library of robust, secure, reusable, accessible UI components. So the next time you're creating um, a tool, an environment, an, OE, uh, an interactive OER, um, have a look at the Fluid components. It it tries to address all of the really, really sort of gnarly, uh, difficult challenges when you're trying to make something accessible. So how do we do things like um, uh, navigate with a keyboard or reorder things with a keyboard? How do we uh, provide a skinning system um, across multiple platforms? Uh, those. Uh, and uh, many of the, the challenges that are not in, at, at the moment addressed very well um, across OERs, but also across learning tools. There's also, as part of it, a supporting architecture to um, enable the types of transformations that the components can um, achieve. And um, the, uh, there is a handbook which gives you examples, which gives you best practices, which shows you what the workflow is um, and uh, all sorts of supports. And that, uh, that handbook or that design handbook that's available within Fluid uh, is, continues to grow, is also sort of a, a, a living handbook, I guess, um, and is supported by a large community of designers and accessibility experts and other practitioners and, and educators around the world. So Fluid is addressing the web application food chain. It, it is in fact now applied in many things other than academic software. So uh, you'll find it in your Firefox browser, you'll find it on your Thunderbird email client, you'll find it in uh, a number of the social networking tools that are coming out. Um, and uh, because it's uh, appearing there, it um, will make it much easier for you to apply it in your open education resources as well and the open education resource delivery chain. So um, I want to leave uh, the last 15 minutes to, for discussions and questions, um, but um, the, the main message I want to give is that uh, the inc inclusively designed open education resources, OERs, OER delivery systems, OER environments um, are reusable, revisable, remixable, and redistributable. And more importantly, they, they achieve many of the principles and goals that we've talked about here at this conference in that they produce a, a truly inclusive community. We're not... Um, leaving out or excluding learners and and I think that that's at the pr uh, one of the main principles of OER and so we should um, really practice what we preach and uh, start to look at how we can uh, not create barriers to um, a whole section of, of learners. So um, I guess my question for the last 15 the rest of the session is um, what are some of your challenges and how can we help? What are, um, and, and also perhaps to, um, given that we have a fairly small audience, but I think you're somewhat representative of the community here, how do we get this message out more broadly within the OER community and how do we start to uh, turn around the, uh, the design practices um, within OER?
not working. So in action, when I would get resistance from people, um, you know, when we don't have the time or resources to make that happen, I would bring in someone who used a screen reader and said, show them how difficult it is to register for a class. All uh, right. So just sometimes that. An example of the problems because they don't believe there's a problem, right? Yeah. Uh huh. And in fact, one of the things I don't know if you noticed, I, I um, as part of the um, open source accessibility forum, I had uh, quite a number of individuals who are experts in the accessibility field who also happen to have disabilities. So they were here on Wednesday, and there was, in fact, there was were some very productive discussions where they were showing how they, in fact, have absolutely no access to most of the OERs that are here. Yeah. So I um, wasn't able to go to that workshop. I just heard about it just now. But so uh, my question was related. Um, do, you, do you find within CMSs or PLEs um, do you find that the open source um, systems, do they tend to be um, more, accept like more accessible or, or do the closed ones that, that have really um, a lot of resources behind it, do they, or do they have the resources to put in the time or how does that work out between the closed and the open? Well, I think the, the open have such a, a, a much better potential to address this well. Um, the closed systems at the moment do quite a bit, but they do it in, um, they don't do it in such a way that it's, uh, it's going to be that sustainable. And, and so my fear in the uh, closed systems is that um, it, it will be, it will get a lot of attention. It's getting a lot of attention now, and there are um, legislative and monetary incentives to pay attention to this. Um, but when those leave or when those when other priorities come up it's not going to be that sustainable i think uh, the the types of of tools and the um the assistance for accessibility should be open. It has to be open. There's absolutely no other way to do it. If if we were to create the next the silver bullet for making something accessible, say to someone who's deaf, and it gets patented or it gets uh, the IP gets protected, um, then people who are deaf will only be able to access the that particular vendor's products, and that's completely counter to um, to the whole goal. So. In, in terms of all of the assistance and the the um, the tools that we need for accessibility, they have to be open um, because they have to be used across the board, or people with disabilities won't be able to use it. But to answer your question, um, Microsoft has done sufficient user studies to show that this is a, a, there's there's a lot of money in this, and so they they are um, addressing it. I mean, they they've shown that 65% of their users um, require some form of alternative access system, um, and so they are are expending quite a bit in making sure that that their systems become accessible, but they're expending it in such a way that it it. it is a, a closed process and and that of course is counter to um, one of the biggest things about accessibility is it needs to be interoperable because every person with a disability is potentially an, a new system that needs to interoperate with your system because they all everybody is using a different set of alternative access systems and they all have to speak to the the whole range of applications there are unfortunately somewhat of a, a number of disjointed efforts at the moment because of of this challenge. Yes, Tom. Just a question about the, how to prioritize um, the development of accessible, uh, uh, well, accessible tools, for example. Um, if, if, if an open source uh, community wants to become more accessible, are there resources that you can point them to to help them understand where to start first? I mean, it's a bit overwhelming, just all of it at once. Right. So, n yeah, so there's... Um the main thing to do is to be flexible. So to um, flexible presentation. So make sure that you can somehow restyle, change the presentation. Do not fix, you know, the, I mean, from as trivial thing as do not fix the font size, do not have a, a fixed layout so that you can't re, uh, uh, 
relay it out uh, so that you can't change the contrast or the 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 spacing and things of that nature um, and those types of things come with like a fluid component so one of the things is if you're going to use a component toolkit um, use uh, and Fluid sits on top of things like Dojo and jQuery that you might be using already. So use the Fluid components if you can. They're, it, they're very, very lightweight. They're easy to use. They're robust code. They've been test and tested uh, like crazy. Um, and they, they work really well. And they ensure that flexibility such that after the fact, when, someone, when a new issue arises, um, we can change it. We can prov create an alternative. We can make it work. Um, the, the other types of flexibility besides presentation flexibility is uh, doing things like not not requiring a mouse. Um, so make sure that there's you can uh, there's a keyboard alternative to the actions and things of that nature that you're going to be using. Um, and there's a f so there's a few principles that allow the flexibility and, th and in that way you don't need to address you know this this vast um, majority or ma vast uh, set or variations of, of accessibility challenges if you make it flexible if you allow the transformation then lots of people will start will be able to and will start to create um, different variations yes Do you have any sure so of OERs, of delivery tools, of... Say of an OER that has been well designed or fluidized or... Sure, yes, definitely. We can, I can show you some. And um, I'll also point you to... Um, so just to quickly go through or to show you... Um, what does fluid include? Um, I'm going to take you to so here are fluid components um, and the they as you can see they address common pain points in most software so that have nothing to do with accessibility necessarily that are just user experience pain points as well so there's things for uh, reordering lists for um, reordering images, reordering um, things within a grid or within a table, um, reordering layout for things like moving onto a mobile platform, um, inline editing that, so that it's accessible and that the, um, it can work in various environments and across different platforms, um, ways of, of previewing things um, when, you made a, when you've made a change. Um, Oh, sorry, uh, these are the preview, actually, these are the components that there's a preview of, but there are also preview. <laughs> um, there are um, navigation tools, there are um, various, so there's a, there's a whole library of UI components. And if you go into the demos, you'll see um, a whole set of demonstrations of these so you can play with and look at how these have been implemented by uh, different so for example oh well this is, this is somewhat simplistic but anyways um, I I won't search for one that is not so simplistic, but there are examples here that you can play with. And um, the the main thing to do is actually play with them, interact with them, because the the um, one of the things about inclusive design is it isn't immediately obvious that this has anything to do with accessibility, but you'll note that if you try to use it with a screen reader or if you try to use it just with a keyboard, it does work. But the the going to your question about the example, I'll take you to Tile. Um, oh. Oh, well, there's time. Okay. So here's a um, 
open education resource, which is a globalization and international migration undergraduate or uh, undergraduate course. Um, and this both shows some things that are done well and some things that are not done well. Um, so this here is uh, the, the OER on globalization and international migration. This, within this window here, was created by the educator. So if we were to look at, say, the, uh, this is a video. Oh, we've got slow. I guess the Wi-Fi is a bit slow. Oh shoot, okay. Um, load, <laughs> okay. But I'll provide a video description of what will happen if you have good Wi-Fi. <laughs> um, so so what, will ha what happens here is this uh, professor, Stephen Castles, talks about globalization um, and but there is there are no captions what I can do then is say here I would like um, alternatives to the audio content and then I can specify that I want to enable captions I want them to be verbatim I want them to be English um, and I can save these and then the next time the video by <laughs> Professor Castles comes up um, it will um, ha be displayed with the um, the um, the video, but the other thing that we can do is um, wait a sec. So let's get something that's much more complex. Say, um, uh -huh, okay. I wanted to show you something where there's structural complexity. Um, we can change the preferences so that it redisplays it in large print, larger spacing, black on white as opposed to, and this will transform. So I, I invite you to play with this when you're actually hooked up to <laughs> a network and um, it, you can then see how the, the resource is created such that it can transform. Yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So exactly. I mean, because we have a text transcript of the of what Professor Castle says, we can choose to. Um, I mean, it'll gracefully degrade better in that even if the video doesn't come through, the transcript can come through. Yeah. That's right. And in fact, one of the um, the main um, participants in the IMS process was um, a, a mining company because what they found is is um, on-site training in a mine is very much like being disabled because you have very noisy environment. Sometimes you have to wear large gloves. Um, often it's dark, um, etc. So you're you're experiencing the same sort of learning barriers that that people with disabilities would experience. <laughs> um, but in terms of the licensing, so it depends on the country. Um, but in general, there are um, copyright uh, uh, provisions for people with print impairments. So that means people who um, cannot uh, process print. So they, uh, that in in the U.S. In includes individuals with who are blind, individuals who have learning disabilities, and individuals who ha have sufficient mobility impairments that they can't handle a book and turn pages. And of course, you know where that, that those provisions came from. I mean, it's from a t a, an era a, a bit a while ago. But those same provisions have been used as a reason um, for making sure that digital resources are um, accessible. And the argument has also been made that um, by simply having a digital resource that is um, where the text is extractable and it's well structured, um, you are providing an accessible resource. Um, the um, so, basically what I'm saying is if uh, you are creating a, an alternative version or an equivalent version or a copy of something for accessibility purposes, there are usually legislative 
uh, uh, allowances for that. But it, it's still an issue, and there are still some. Um, I mean, certainly in, especially in video, especially in broadcast and previously broadcast media, and those sorts of things. Uh, there are a number of battles that are are going on at the moment. And is that what I Oh, so uh, IP issues here um, with um, with Tile or this particular implementation, all educators agree to a, a, a Creative Commons um, uh, license uh, with uh, and. But the other thing that we had to do here is we had to. Um, uh, acknowledge, the acknowledgement part was huge. So there is a huge database of who created what, right down to the who made the modification on this particular sentence type of thing, and a, um, a way to visualize um, who all contributed to this particular resource or this version of the resource, and what are the other versions that other people have contributed to. So one of the concessions we we had to make was to make sure that that acknowledgement or the authorship was was well documented and that documentation would continue and that people could view that. Yeah, so um, the the preferences um, are intended to be portable, but they can be they can be stored. And so, for um, depending upon the the implementation, there they can be stored on a server, or they and they're um, because of the the uh, privacy issues. Um, th there's various types of servers and various sort of privacy protection uh, components to it. Although the the preference profile really has no personal identification in it. There's no way to to trace it back to a particular learner, and the um, the information within it is simply functional information. I want the display in this context. Oh, um, Blackboard doesn't at the moment. Desire to Learn uses it, and and Angel used it before they got bought up. Um, but yes, the I mean I, I'm not sure if I'm answering your question, but one of the things that can be done is uh, an LMS can point to where a storage place where the preference is, or the preference can be stored. And um, but no, Blackboard at the moment does not make do the transformation, but there are many that do. Yeah. Um, the right. So the intention was to sit to work together with Dojo and jQuery. So um, if you'll note that they, they, it sits on top of jQuery, it can be used with Dojo. It can be used with uh, GWT. It can be used with um, many of the other widget sets. So it's not to create an alternative. It's to play well with and to address some of the gaps that. That those widget sets don't um, address. Yeah, that's right. And so you'll see the fluid components as part of the the things like the keyboard is part of jQuery at the moment.